Welcome to the Orville Sympathy for the Devil novella here on the Union Federation podcast on the Fandom Podcast Network. My name is Kevin, and here on Union Federation, we talk both Star Trek and the Orville. And we're really excited to talk about this Orville lost episode, but I can't do this alone. I'd like to welcome my crew, and with me is from the BQN, host of many, many, many Star Trek podcasts. I'd like to welcome Miss Amy Nelson. Amy, how are you? I am doing great. So glad to be talking Orville again. It's been too long and this is going to be so much fun. Yeah, I'm very curious to uh, get your thoughts on this because all I've heard from you is you've got thoughts. So I have thoughts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, uh, my co-founder uh, and co-captain, uh, Kyle, he couldn't make it with us today. Uh, the, uh, uh, the alien tax gods have taken him away temporarily, but uh, I'm sure he'll sh share his thoughts on this book on a future episode of Union Fed. But we do have someone else, Amy, from the BQN. Who we got? Well, we have my co-host of Galaxy Class, Mr. Joe Keegan. Welcome, Joe. Cool. Hi, hi, this is just weirdly nerve-wracking. I feel like I'm not on Galaxy class, so I'm out of my comfort zone. So it's strange. I hope I have thoughts and kind of whole sentences to say. Well, tell me a little bit about your Orville fandom, because uh, here on the um, Union Federation, of course, Amy, myself, uh, Kyle, and Haley have been covering the Orville since it first premiered, and we're all big fans of it. It took a little bit longer for a few of us uh in the group to to get you know one over by it but in the end we've all become fans of it and are curious if we're going to see any more your uh, quick history and your fandom of the orville hey i think i've been a fan going back way back to season one since it first started um the humor obviously in season one it's very family guy isn't it it's very seth mcfarlane and i like how more recently they've, they've gotten away from that kind of toilet humor and more doing serious sci-fi um but yeah right from the get-go although i think memory serves that we in the uk didn't get it initially it took us a while was it not it's now on disney so, plus for us but it wasn't initially it was on some weird service that we don't get so I can't um what kind of buzz were you hearing about it? Because I know there was a lot of Star Trek fans that were like, nah, it's just making fun of Star Trek. It's a parody. But when people started watching and talking about it, it's like, no, it's found its own home, its own way. Did you start to hear that and go, okay, I need to see this? Or were you in from the beginning whenever you could get a chance um, to watch it? Absolutely. And from the beginning, as soon as I saw the first episode, it was I realized it was doing Star Trek almost better than Star Trek does Star Trek. Um, like it, 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 for me, being a TNG fan as a teenager, it felt like that. It was new TNG for me. Um, yeah. Just down to the tricolor uniforms and the, the feel of the ship. And they do, the Orville do what current Star Trek doesn't do. They let you see long shots of the ships. Mm. That's kind of That's good a starship porn, if you're allowed to say that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because the starships are characters, and but in New Star Trek, the you don't Excellent get to point. see that be because they, I don't know, they overload everything with lens flare. Yeah, there's lens a flare certain... has killed New Star Trek. Yeah, there's a certain beauty to the uh, the shots we get in Orville of their starships. Uh, and Amy, you know, uh, Joe just touched on something about how we are getting a little bit of a TNG um, vibe, a little bit, more than a little bit, to where that you came up with a great idea uh, last year, and before that, I think it was, where we actually compared some Star Trek TNG episodes with Orville episodes that had similar themes and kind of debated who handled it better, and those were a lot of fun. Oh, hold on. You're muted. Yeah, that was really <laughs> fun. And we need to do that for season three. We haven't even discussed that, but they definitely, you see the, I don't know if you want to call them tropes, but you see it done on yeah. Star Trek and then you see it done on Orville. And it has been really fun to compare and look at the characters and how they're approaching the, the topic. 
Well, when we when we find a break between Orville and Star Trek not being aired, uh, we'll have to try and squeeze those in and do some more because there were some episodes this final, I'm not going to say final season yet of Orville, but season three that I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that TNG episode. We would they would come up organically. Yeah, in the conversations were like, yeah, we should definitely compare those. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we are talking about the last episode sympathy for the devil uh and i want to give a little intro here before um uh, uh amy you go ahead and give us the uh the plot synopsis here so sympathy for the devil uh the episode was is a novella the orville published by hyperion avenue the episode takes place in the third season between midnight blue episode eight and domino episode nine the episode synopsis read when Ed Mercer and the crew of the USS Orville come face to face with one of humanity's most vile ide ideologists, they must solve the moral conundrum of who to hold accountable for evil deeds real and imagined. We'll get more into that plot synopsis in a second. Sympathy for the Devil was originally written by Seth MacFarlane as the ninth episode of season three, who later called it an outlier and a conceptually experimental story. The script was jettisoned when the COVID-19 pandemic made filming abroad too difficult to manage. The lost script was picked up by publisher Hyperion Avenue and as a tie-in novella and published on July 19, 2022. An audiobook for, uh, version was released at the same time, read by actor Bruce Boxleitner, a.k.a. Alcuzan, President Alcuzan. It is 35 pages in length. The season was initially announced as consisting of 11 episodes, but one episode was not filmed. This one, Sympathy for the Devil. Uh, and um, I did want to mention, guys, I watched a video. I think it was a, a Comic-Con video, and he talked about this. And it was very fascinating because he does want to do this episode if there is a season four. and. Hmm he does mention the COVID pandemic at the time, because remember they, I don't know if you remember this, Amy, when we were uh, covering these episodes, we found out that like, while they were shooting one episode, they might film parts of another episode with like a second unit director because of the restrictions and the time that they had allotted. And you'll notice too, that there's those same corridors in midnight blue and in domino that this episode takes place that are those Mocklin corridors. And you can tell that those sets were made and reused again in both episodes. But he was mentioning that they, they couldn't film because at the particular time there was those hardcore COVID-19 restrictions in the LA County area. And it met him traveling abroad. If they could do it, they just couldn't do it. Because as you, you imagine, when we talk about this episode and the times that it takes place, they had to scrap it. So with that now, Amy, why don't you go ahead and give us the uh, plot synopsis of Sympathy for Devil. In 1914, New York City, a woman leaves her baby at the front desk of a hotel and never returns. The staff decide to give the baby to a German couple staying in the hotel who named the baby Otto and returned with him to Germany. As a teenager, Otto begins to sympathize with the Nazi party and develops a strong disdain for Jews and joins the German SS. Otto later marries and fathers a son. Otto becomes a commander of a concentration camp where he kills Jewish prisoners to entertain himself. Ed and Kelly arrive at the camp and end the program revealing Otto's reality to be a simulation and take Otto to the Orville to his parents, who reveal his true name to be Adam. Adam's parents recount that they were energy researchers living and working in a below ground laboratory when the Krill attacked their laboratory to steal their research. Adam's mother hid him in their 1914 simulation before the Krill abducted and imprisoned them and Adam was left to be raised by the simulator for nearly 30 years. Adam has difficulty adjusting to reality, and the Orville crew unsuccessfully attempt to deprogram him. Adam escapes from his quarters and takes an officer hostage whom he has, oh, whom, whom he has taken to the ship simulator where he has a computer create a simulation of his wife and son in a reality where Germany won World War II. 
Ed and Tala apprehend Adam and arrange for him to be sent to a facility for extensive psychological deprogramming. Decades led, later, an elderly Adam is working at a baker and runs into Ty Finn and mentioned Ty's mother helped him during a difficult time. I have to ask you guys, Amy, how did you read this? Did you read the digital uh, novella or did you get it on audiobook like I did? It was on audiobook, thanks to Joe. We <laughs> <laughs> shared some things there. <laughs> um, and I actually listened to this twice. Um, I'll get into why that was. But yeah, I listened to it. Um, and it's, yeah, audiobook. Uh, Man in the High Castle, anyone? A little alternate universe mentioned here. So yeah. Uh, Joe, uh, how did you, you, you listen to the audiobook then? Yes, um, I was literally just thinking about Man in the High Castle when Amy was reading out the synopsis. Uh, I would not have read this. I would not have heard about it unless Amy had mentioned it to me. Um, I'd listened to a lot of audiobooks. Um, my commute is about two and a half hours a day, um, sometimes three and a half, sometimes five, but um, that's when traffic's really bad. Um, so, yeah, it was a quick listen, a little over three hours long. Um I quite a few give times. Your, give us your first impressions on this. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, um, I um, a few times had to check that I was listening to the right thing because it you. didn't seem like Orville. <laughs> is that because? Is that because like the first seven chapters we had no introduction to the Orville cast at all? <laughs> exactly. I thought there was maybe a, a glitch in Audible and they'd uploaded the wrong the wrong audio file. Um but yeah I was kinda it was kind of a, a compelling story so I wanted to continue listening. Yeah. Yeah I remember messaging you Joe saying what in the heck what is going on Nazis I thought I was reading an Orville book <laughs> didn't hear anything about the characters I was very frustrated and not happy. And you know, I'd already finished it by that point yeah. and I was like no keep on going just stick with it it'll explain it all it, you'll you don't it's, it. it's funny you say that, guys, because I was in a similar situation because uh, I'm listening to Bruce Boxleitner, who we have, if you're watching the uh, video of this on YouTube. Uh, of course, we know Bruce from uh, Tron and Babylon 5. Well, he plays President Alcazan, and uh, he uh, has several uh, parts in the this uh, season of the Orville. And uh, he gets to read the audiobook. So it's nice to hear his voice, but I'm like, I, I first started listening to it, and I'm like, okay. I think I really need to pay attention to what's going on because we're still talking about Nazis here and uh, World War One and World War Two, and I was uh, I was a little thrown off as well. And then I committed to it, and just got into it big time, and uh, um, I was uh, I, I did enjoy it. Um, there's some things that I'm like, mm, but it's really weird though. As I'm listening to it and I'm finishing it, and they finally introduce the the Orville cast and uh, how they're, you know, how they're dealing with uh, Otto slash Adam and, and, you know, you know, how do you deal with a person like this who believes you this person? And, and I just started thinking like, would this have fit if they actually filmed this as an episode, Amy? Yeah. So one of the reasons why I had to read it again, cause I had such a bad taste in my mouth, not understanding what the story was about. I think for me, it would have been better had I been given a synopsis that it's starting, you know, in the simulation. I mean, I like the twist, but I was too thrown out that the twist fell flat for me. So I did watch the two episodes that it's supposed to be sandwiched in between. And I did want to ask, like, in Domino, they are describing that they have had success with reprogramming the Kalon is what they were talking about. And then they mentioned some person, but that's not Adam slash Otto. And that wasn't a success in reprogramming. So I'm asking you where it does it really truly fit in. And when they're talking about it in Domino, that can't be this story. Yeah. I know they were talking about that one Kalon that was living with those people Right. And, and uh, he had been reprogrammed. 
And, and so that, I think that's what they were referencing. Okay. Uh, that was in an earlier episode, uh, I right. the, the one off the top of my head. So I think that's what they were referring to uh, on that yeah, one. Yeah, so then I didn't know why this novella fit in between the two. I yeah, guess so, it, it yeah, so we had mid- anywhere. Yeah, so we had Midnight Blue. Uh, I have pictures up here as well. This is the Mocklin uh, episode that uh, uh, Dolly Parton had a cameo in, of course, and Havina, uh, the Mocklin woman, uh, who is smuggling a uh, Mocklin woman out of Mocklis, uh, um, gets uh, Bordas's uh, daughter, and I'm forgetting her name right now, I'm sorry, uh, to kind of uh, work with her. And of course, uh, Bordas is not a fan of that, but she gets captured. Uh, Bordas's daughter gets captured by by uh, the Mocklins, and and um, they have to go rescue her. And then at the end of that episode, the Mocklins are removed from the uh, uh, Union Federation or the, un- the Union uh, group there. And, um, you know, and so so we have some closure there. But then you go straight to nine where we get into the whole Krill and Mocklin uh, uneasy alliance because of this weapon that the um, uh, that the Union comes up with that can kill the Kalon. And they show that force, that might, and then um, eventually they uh, have an uneasy alliance with the Kalon against the Krill and the uh, um, the Mocklins. And this, is a for- unfortunately, is the one where um, Charlie has to give her life uh, to, you know, to uh, destroy the weapon and get everyone else to escape and such. But I was trying to fit like where, did, you know, how would this go in there because there really wasn't much mention. So. I guess what I'm, I'm my, what I'm trying to think here is that this kind of feels like a, um, oh, what do you call it? One of those standalone episodes where mm-hmm. you have Charlie in this episode. Um, her, her, her character is in this, mm-hmm. uh, is mentioned, but she's not a main character. But there is a mention to her in this novella about how she feels about loss and if anyone feels that she would. Uh, and life-changing moments. And of course she's gone through a whole character change in this whole season. You know, she, she doesn't trust uh, obviously the Kalon and, and she doesn't like working with Isaac and then things kind of start to change a little bit and they have a moment, but for this episode, you know, you get someone who is stuck in a similar, a simulator and in order to save their son's life, because uh, the Krill attacked, these people's home um i guess in this uh sub layer somewhere i guess is what i'm doing here and and then they get captured so he's stuck in the simulator and it just naturally progresses forward into what would happen from 1914 new york being dropped off and at first i didn't realize that this was a real kid being dropped off not a simulator kid you know <laughs> uh so we go through World War One, and uh, we see him make these changes, and he be- gets in. He becomes a Nazi, and you know we've seen we've seen a lot of uh, movies regarding Nazis, and you know um, what happens in concentration camps. Schindler's List is a big one there, um, but he becomes an SS SS um, stormtrooper basically, which are the most feared and ruthless officers in world war two. And when I was uh, doing some um, kind of research of what kind of character Otto or Adam reminds me of, and I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this. I thought of two movies. I thought of *Inglorious bastards and um, Schindler's list and Schindler's list. Uh, uh, Rafe Fiennes plays Eamon Geth and he is just ruthless. He oversees an actual, um, concentration camp and in glorious bastards you got christoph waltz who won an oscar for that role as hans landa uh who is his job to find jews and search them out but did you guys have any idea of like you know what type of person or even person this was cast as joe what what was going through your mind with this character as you're realizing how ruthless he's becoming Uh, i don't think i actually pictured anybody playing him um Really? But when I saw that, um, who is the guy you showed there? Not Christoph Waltz, the other guy. Yeah. That, I think that's him, isn't it? Yeah, that that's yeah, that's um that's Rafe Fines. Fines. Yeah, yeah, Rafe Fines, yeah. I think yeah. now that is the yeah. I'm gonna see Otto as that image now from Forevermore. 
Um, so just to come back to the point about where it fits in between episodes eight and nine of season three, I honestly don't really care what it comes. Um, I think I'm a bit of a sucker for historical dramas like Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer um, story, yeah. the, the Ryan Murphy show. I watched the new All Quiet in the Western Front. And I just feel that these, yeah, they might take artistic license with the, the storytelling and historical facts, but knowing that these kind of events actually happened um, almost traumatizes me in a way. Um, so just knowing that this the first half of the novella was about the Holocaust um, and then realising that it was just a, a baby that was stuck in a holiday programme. And like, I don't think my brain could actually comprehend the the magnitude of the story, really. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah, about I, you? What about you, Amy? Yeah, a couple of things, Joe, of what of what you were saying. When they're dropping off the baby and then we find out it's a simulation, totally gave me discovery vibes with uh the burn. What was his name that was left in the simulator? Had a oh, temper yeah. tantrum and yeah. What's his name from oh. The Saru's planet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kelpian yeah. guy. Yeah, the Kelpian. Yes. Um, totally gave me that vibes. And I'm you know, when I found out like Adam was raised in this simulator, I was like, oh my gosh, that's just ripped straight from Star Trek. Um, but what this no novella did so amazingly well, and you brought up those other two movies, which definitely give a more historical perspective. But the way that this was written and the way that Seth explained Otto's devotion and passion for the Nazi and the philosophies that were had, I actually felt sorry for him. Like it was explained so well how someone could think so evilly. Um, it was scary. Yeah it, yeah, it it was scary on how real and they he would use names you, you know from real life. Yeah, you know? like hit like uh Himmler and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. It's, and especially when you saw in the beginning where he's a boy and there's that Jewish um uh oh. baker that like yes. kind of helps him and defends him, you know. Yeah. And uh it it was, you know, a lot of Nazis rose through high power when they were able to impress other like Nazi, you know, generals and stuff like that, especially when he's talking about, there's that very interesting scene at the party where he sees that beautiful girl. And he doesn't realize he's talking to her father and her father, his father says, well, what would you do to, what would you say to a woman like that? He says, I would marry her, you know, <laughs> and he introduces her. <laughs> her as his daughter you know and then it worked out and that was a very interesting scene but it's how you got caught up into that scene that you could see that um you know and i've heard of stories where there was like a lot of uh um people that were half jewish german that would hide their jewish side to survive you know and uh it you know there's that really hard scene to listen to uh when bruce reads it in the audiobook where he is you know, doing his thing where he's uh, tormenting the Jewish prisoners and he decides to pick on a older Jewish guy because he knows that he can't give him the labor that he wants. And it was just basically, you know, um, egging this guy on to make an example of the rest of the uh, prisoners of what not to do and don't try to fight back or anything like that. And it, I was getting flashbacks to uh, Schindler's List, you know, and uh, especially the scene where Eamon is just like waking up in his bedroom and he's looking down with his scope and his rifle and he sees this old Jewish lady taking a rest and he just kills her, you know, mm -hmm. and then people start working faster around her, you know, and it's just a heartbreaking scene among many of that film. Uh, but I want to ask you guys something as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking like, okay, how would they have filmed this? Obviously uh, in that interview that I mentioned with Seth and uh, um, I think it was the Comic-Con crowd, he talked about the possibility of going to like Yugoslavia and a lot of these countries that have these tax breaks and it's easier and cheaper for American film productions to go to, but that double for other countries. Uh, unfortunately he couldn't do that. But I was thinking like the way this novella was written, you're, you're in seven chapters before Ed and Kelly walk in on the simulation. 
So do you see the episode actually going? If this is like an hour, five minute episode, maybe 10 at the most, maybe 15, because there was a couple that were like that. Do you see like maybe a half hour of this episode of nothing but this flashback, Amy? Well, if we were to follow the novella, yes, I would. Um, and then we'd be like, what in the heck is going on? And sort of what you were saying, like this was an experiment, a thought experiment. And I think that that would be very fitting and it would, you know, yeah, be one of those episodes that it's like, what in the heck are we doing? But so opened your brain to these different ideas of, yeah, how are you going to do you punish Otto for these crimes that he committed in a simulation? Like mm. it's very, yeah, you could debate that, but you need that history so that you understand the fullness of his intent, I guess. What do you think, Joe? Do you think that uh, uh, there would have been a good half hour here? And would that have been captivating enough for you to be watching this Orville episode? I would go longer than a half hour. Yeah. I, I think that it's powerful enough and just um, finding out about Otto and living Otto's life from he's a baby until where um, Mercer and um, oh, I can't remember their names because it's not Star Trek um, where they <laughs> inter intervene in the environmental simulator um, I think they could go right up to like 55 minutes and the last 5 minutes is just oh we're going to we're going to rescue him and try and deprogram him and that fails and he gets sent off to this I kind of like that. I kind of like that. That's that's a risk. I like yeah. that. Uh -huh. Cuz I think we the last see as soon as they intervened in the simulator I was like, oh, "Okay." That all the pieces fell into place in my brain and I I didn't really have to know more. Yeah, I could see that. Explained. I could see the first 45 minutes of this Orville episode being this novella and possibly more like you just said. Yeah, but being like dark and yeah. and like R not R R rated. Do we do R rated Orville? Yeah, because in order to really get the full aspect of how horrible this person became, Amy, you can't touch this on ten minutes, could you? I don't think so. Hold on, Amy. But I think that you still need the backside after the denouement, I guess, because that one scene, it chills me to the bone where he's, you know, talking to Finn and Ed and he's like, are any Jews working yeah. here? Yeah. And it's like, dude, <sighs> you have just been shown the truth. You know that it's a simulation. You know that this is not how we do things. And yet, <clears throat> and yet still he couldn't get out of his mind oh my gosh, am I going to be working with Jews? And that ends it on such a not happy note yeah. that it's so realistic that I like that at odds ending, Joe. Can, can you I, imagine? I, Joe, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, I think it's so easy to say that um, our auto come on, you can see that everything was a lie, but when you've been programmed from birth, to think a certain way and believe a specific thing that to suddenly be wrenched out of that to be told, oh no, everything was a lie and this is what life is actually like. Um, it happens in real life. I keep on thinking of the the British girl, um, British Muslim girl um, a few years ago, Shamima Begum, and she was radicalised in the UK. And then she went to, I can't remember which country she went to in the Middle East, um, to help or work for Islamic State um, terrorist organization um, then she wanted to come back to the UK and she's been completely vilified mm. as if she's yeah. some don't let her back in because um, she's a terrorist and she's going to blow everybody up but she was radicalized here as a child and then she got to leave and come back so yeah I'm, I'm confused by the whole idea that um, it would be really easy just to go, I, oh, okay, this is new reality. That line or that scene in the book that you just mentioned, uh, Amy, about how he's trying to wrap his head around everything, but then he says, is there Jews on this ship? I'm like, oh, yep. that, oh, I can only imagine 
that being acted out um, with the cat, the wonderful cast that we have here. Um, and so I want to ask you going from that, we go to the very end of the novella and decades later, an elderly Adam is working as a baker and runs into Ty Finn, Claire's son, and mentioned that Ty's mother had helped him during a difficult time. So we can only imagine that Claire spent a lot of time with now Adam. This is very interesting guys, because we get a flash forward into the Orville itself, where I don't know if we've really gotten a go into the future type moment with the Orville before. Yeah, I'm, you're right. I'm kind of curious how they would have handled that or if that, I mean, I assume Amy that the scene would have had to have been done because we had to end it on some type of hope that people can be helped. Right. Yeah, but Okay, so how I read it, it's like, yeah, we see him as a baker and I still don't believe that he's changed. I still think he has those prejudices against Jews. I, I think he still wants to have this pure race. Is this um, why you want to see it in live action to read the face? On the yeah. Dang it, you know? <laughs> yes, because... And, and I was confused why it was Ty Finn. But now that you're saying, well, yeah, your mom, how Otto was giving credit to his mom, then that would make sense if she were, you know, spending a significant amount of time reprogramming him, then they might have you know, more significance, you know. So that's why Ty would visit him. And then right. I was also, I wasn't sure. So is Ty visiting him in the real world or is auto gone back to living in a sim simulation i That's, got the, yeah. i got the impression this was the real world uh decades later what did you think joe i mean I, I, doesn't I think anything that we come up with here is just going to be pure speculation because okay. there's a small it's like as even a chapter so you're where... saying i need to tweet seth again find out right please yes please because it, it could be a simulation he could say mm. i'm not doing this put me back in a simulator i'll live the, out the rest of my life there yeah okay. and why yeah. why the baker yeah so i'm i've got a clockmaker in my mind um see the the very when we meet him on the street and he's been bullied by two bigger boys and yeah. the the store mm -hmm. owner comes out. Is the store yes. owner a baker or a, or a clockmaker? Baker. Baker. Okay. Yeah. But then there's a, a clockmaker scene later on where the Gestapo, the SS, go in and kind of throw the clockmaker out and smash up his shop. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, um, right. Um, yeah, I kind of like to think that... Has he... Was he savable? Well, I think maybe he's just, he's in, Ty Finn has grown up to become a, a doctor like his mum and is now working at the deprogramming place and they're still working to try and deprogram him, possibly. Yeah. And he's in some kind of 1935 bakery in Germany. I still yeah. think it's a simulation. Yeah, it's, it's tough because it doesn't really I mean it, it makes you think that we're in the future but yeah it, it that's tough tough call if it if his simulation is real and he's and Ty is just coming to visit him mm -hmm. with that said I want to touch on the cast a little bit here guys real quick okay I think Penny Johnson Gerald would have really had a moment in this episode if it was real because she's the one that, you know, obviously is not only a great doctor, but uh, um, a great doctor for the head as well. <laughs> and I have a feeling, as mentioned uh, um, at the end of this uh, novella, that she obviously helped Adam a lot. Um, and, you know, a lot, there's some scenes with some of the other cast and characters in here. But, um, I, Amy, I want to start with you. When you are listening to this like I am, you're obviously thinking of the actors that we are familiar with in these scenes. Do you think that, that there is a particular scene that we l listen to in this novella that the main cast would have really had a moment with? Yeah, when you were talking about Dr. Finn, like I can definitely see her with so much compassion, but yet the skills and the strategies to help him transition. 
Um, I just think that that would be a tremendous scene, especially for yeah Penny Johnson, because she can emote and be this amazing doctor and help Otto the best. Joe, what about you? Who do you think would have could have had a good moment in this episode with Adam? It has Otto. to be Penny, doesn't it? It has to be Dr. Finn because she's a woman of color trying to help this guy mm. that out of the pretty much the entire crew, he's not what, going to want her to help him. Yeah, so she's overcoming not, that as well. Yeah, she, she's not part of the Aryan race. No blonde hair, blue eyes here. Yep. Um, and you can imagine the words coming out of his mouth, just the, the vile hatred for her. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can imagine she's not going to know really how to cope with that level of hatred because you're living in the perfect future. I think there could have been two minor scenes with a couple of the uh, co-stars or, or, or the cast members. I think that could have been touched on uh, not saying embellished on, but maybe if, you know, something added to the script, not just, you know, part of the novella was um, Isaac because he was part of a race that wanted to um, eliminate humans. Yeah, purify. Purify, yeah. Also, the idea, the ideas and the uh, prejudice that the Nazis had, we also have seen with the Mocklin, you know, uh, towards women. And uh, I, I think that uh, a scene with, uh, you know, Bordas and Isaac would have been really interesting to kind of play off what was going on here. I thought that would have been interesting. What do you guys think? Amy? Yeah, I was actually thinking, no, go to Joe next. Joe. It would be interesting to see how Otto and or Adam interacts with Bordas and um, the the. Uh, Chief of Security, um, whose name escapes me, like anybody that's alien, right? Is, does that serve as proof that, or is it just part of the the West's simulation? Yeah, they kept him sequestered them? because remember they said security detail, but human only in the novella to mm, try because they didn't want the him to see any aliens yet. <laughs> yeah, and cover up all the windows because we yeah. don't want him seeing that he's floating about in space. Yeah. Um, yeah, Amy, sorry. Well. It just talking about the actors or the characters, I didn't see. Um, oh, okay. I didn't see. Okay. Engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Lee, John, John Lamar. Yeah. I didn't see yeah. Lamar and right, right. didn't hear pilot guy. Yeah. Scott Grimes. I, yeah. Malloy. Malloy. Yeah. Malloy. Yeah. I think. He, Why are we forgetting these names, Amy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like we've never seen the show. <laughs> If it was, it was just a passing moment, I think. Yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But I did miss them because I really do like Malloy I, and, you, and Malloy. you know what's interesting? I was trying to figure out which actor could have played Otto Vogel, aka Adam Collier. And I just couldn't do it because of how uh, bad and harsh this person was. And I, I would have this is where you have to kind of give it to the casting because I'm sure they would have found someone really, really good. Maybe someone that's not quite known, but someone I think that just could have really chewed this scene up. I don't know if you guys, I just thought I'd throw it back at you because I have no idea uh, of who you think would have made a good uh, auto slash Adam. Joe, what do you think? Um, I was thinking, who's the guy that plays the new um, Flash in the DC movies? He's a bit nuts in real life. Oh, oh um, gosh, I can't remember his name. Okay. Yeah. Oh God! Is this the actor that's having a lot of trouble? Yes, e uh, Ezra, 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 Ezra Miller. Miller. Ezra, yeah, Ezra Miller. Ezra Miller. Yeah, he yeah, might yeah. be good. Um, then I was thinking, who's a really good bad guy? Um, and I'm thinking the character Fade Rother Harkonnen from the Dune books. And they've just cast Austin Butler as Fade Rother. Oh, Austin Butler, who is Elvis. He's a yeah, brilliant, brilliant actor, but oh I think God, he's got. Man. They could do his hair, like give him some kind of Nazi. Oh, he's got this very cut. angular face and stuff. Yes, yeah. so they could. Oh, and he's got that kind of voice too. Mm, yeah. That's a good one. That and do, do you know why he's such a good actor that he could literally play 
Yeah. Probably play our brains out. <laughs> That's, uh, Amy, what about the, you? Did you did you have yeah. anyone? Who's the is it Adam Driver? But he might oh, be too too famous. Dark haired. Oh, they can oh, wigs, yeah. wigs and yeah, hair. Adam guy. Driver from uh, Kylo Ren from the yeah. Star Wars, that's uh, yeah. yeah. I was thinking Kylo Ren oh. about that. Um, and but then I was like, oh, he would have been good. Yeah, because he's yeah. got that, and he has military movie. experience too. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, let's get Joe back in here. There you go, Joe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Adam Driver would have been a good one, man. See, you guys, I, I was just drawing blanks. I just couldn't do it because just how horrible this guy was in this book. So yeah, I yeah. Been, Adam Driver's too famous. I think. Yeah, uh, he would have been good though. Yeah. Well, you know, Seth has gotten some famous people to come in that you didn't think would come in. You know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's got totally. Hollywood pull. You know, he totally could have made a call saying, "Yo." Okay, so I do want to make that connection to the scene with Dolly Parton in the episode right before this novella. Okay. And when Havina comes walking in and sees Dolly and she's like, oh, well, this is all fake. And Dolly's like, well, it may be fake, but we're here. So let's, and she just made it seem like, although it's fake, you still have emotions. You can still talk. We can still enjoy we can have some time together. And what Dolly does is just it transforms that uh, simulation into something real. And I feel like that that's a good tie in to this novella, that it's a simulation, but it's real, yeah. especially to Otto. Yeah, definitely. Can we talk? I don't know if this is on our outline, but can we talk about the simulation, the environmental simulator for a minute and how advanced it is compared to um, the, the holiday and stuff? I Trek? actually have a segment at the end of the show where we're okay. going to talk about that. So trust Please. me, hold on to that thought. I, I, but, but, before, but before we do that, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to, from the uh, Union Federation discussion here, let you know what other great shows are on the Fandom Podcast Network. We're going to talk a little bit of tropes, and we're going to get into a little article about how dark this one was and a little more uh, discussion on that. And then we'll definitely get into the difference of the holodeck and the simulators. But we'll, we'll be right back. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast. We cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show. Our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU Podcast discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. All right, welcome back. We've been discussing the Orville Sympathy for the Devil novella, the lost slash scrapped episode that would have been between episode eight and nine of season three of the Orville. And uh, I want to get into a little bit of article here with Away Mission number two.
All right. I found a good article here on Arcadia Pod uh, by author Stephen Kay. It says, The Orville Sympathy for the Devil is a book that proposes an ethical dilemma I'm not sure I've seen fleshed out so fully in a science fiction story before. What would happen if a child were to be raised evil? If the child were to grow to commit numerous atrocities that, while simulated, were every bit as awful as one can imagine? Did they actually commit a crime? Can a person like that come back into society at all? That's a big question. This is exactly what happened in this relatively short but incredibly impactful story from Seth MacFarlane that was supposed to be filmed as part of a third season of the television show, The Orville. Um, and I want to skip ahead to the article because I thought this was very interesting and I remember this very, very well. The plot is reminiscent of, of an old Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode called Hard Time. Thank you for mentioning that it's old, author. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed with numerous Star Trek holiday episodes and even The Matrix. The Star Trek episode dealt with the character Chief O'Brien coming to terms with the fact that he had been subjected to a simulated 20-year prison sentence in a matter of hours, only to be haunted by his experiences, such as murdering his cellmate. Sympathy for the Devil takes a similar concept and makes it far more cruel as it focuses on a person raised in a simulation led to a path of pure evil by an algor algorithm and being forced to come to terms with their life being entirely fake and them a zealot for a cause that ended five centuries ago. This is handled expertly. And he goes on to say that it felt like it was an episode, old episode of The Outer Limits, and how dark that it was. So, Joe, how dark was this this episode? Was it too dark for the Orville? Are you are are you surprised that maybe someone else told Seth, "Yes, we have location shooting issues with COVID." But man, this is dark. <laughs> I do you know what? I think if we want good sci-fi in our lives then we're going to have to go to dark places because no matter what star trek the next generation taught us the future isn't going to be all rosy like you're living on a cruise liner in space there is going to be like shades of gray and darkness um, associated with it so i'm all for this episode being super dark and asking really important questions because if we don't ask these important questions and learn from what's happened in real history then we're never going to improve and we're never going to not make them again. You know, Amy, Joe made an excellent point, And that's something that we've discussed on these podcasts, Union Fed, regarding the Orville, that it feels like they've touched on some um, topics that I'm not saying Star Trek has skirted around, but it definitely inspired by it. But they actually get deep into a lot of this stuff. Um, and, and I'm not saying cross the line but have gone to an area that sometimes maybe we felt Star Trek should have done? What are your thoughts? Well, one area that I see that they've done that I haven't seen, like with Hard Time, they mentioned that Deep Space Nine Hard Time, like Miles is put into the simulation. He, and then, you know, realizes, oh, this isn't real, even though he thought it was real. Like there's that little trick. And I've always asked the question on Galaxy Class and on Union Fed, like, could you truly be happy in a simulation knowing that it's fake? Like when uh, Riker gets Q powers, okay, I'm going to snap my fingers. And then could you live, could Wesley live that way? No, couldn't. So we get this flipped on its head. And could you live in a simulation if you never knew it wasn't real? I love the scene where, uh, Mercer is explaining to Adam slash Otto, you know, you've never felt pain. You, everything has gone right for you. What an amazing life to have everything go right. And you think it's real. Like, this is what life is. I don't know. Would you want to have that experience? Yeah, it's, it's tough. I yeah, think they it is. explore it here very well. Yeah, no, you're right. That brings up a really good question regarding that and how you can live. But the thing that I thought was fan when you were talking about that, and Joe, I wanted to get your opinion on this. You reminded me of something, Amy, when they go to Otto slash Adam and saying, are you ever wondered why you never got hurt or yep. felt pain or any injury? Wouldn't that cross your mind? Or, I mean, he was he 
it, it was amazing that there was stuff that didn't come up that made him question his mortality and why it wasn't happening to him and he him getting hurt. What do you think, Joe? Would that just serve as more proof that he is like the the chosen race as a member of the the most powerful uh, race on the planet? And possibly, Germany's, yeah. Germany's yeah. got the right to rule yeah. the earth. Um, and look at him; he's invincible. He and he's rising up the ranks through, uh, rising up through the ranks of the the Nazi party. Um, oh yeah. Um, that's a self fulfilling prophecy, and because that AI yeah. program is going to go, what's quote unquote best for him. So it's learning off of his actions and his desires. Hmm. To bring it back to the Chief O'Brien thing, I think that I don't think there are apples and oranges. I don't think you can really equate the two. Chief O'Brien had um basically a simulation implanted like over a very short period of time. Um and he had it done as well it was an adult. So but he had um, normal childhood experiences until he was what, in his mid thirties, and then they had had this twenty years of his prison sentence implanted. Otto was brought up for his entire life in the simulation. He had no other experience um, to base his personality off of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, this I, when I was thinking about that hard time episode, and I remember that. If I remember right, Chief had to, something happened where he had to be punished. And this was this alien's version of punishment and excellent acting uh, by Cole Meaning, by by the way. Uh, And it just got me thinking about how, what, whatever actor that they chose to possibly play this character of Otto slash Adam, if we would have seen the pain of realizing this isn't real, but then maybe also saying, you know what, Amy? He wanted to go back and live in the simulation with his with his uh, his his wife and his son. And I want to bring up a trope here: the alternate history Nazi victory in universe, as we see in the uh, I think it's the Amazon series, The Man in the High Tower. Otto orders a simulator to put him in the future, where he's with his family again after the Nazis have won. Uh, on the TV in the simulation, it's mentioned that the Nazis conquered the U.S. and are stamping out the last resistance in South America. The irony is Nazis escaped to South America. And if you're a fan of the new Amazon series called Hunters, uh, it's in season two now. And it takes place in the 70s about how there are Nazi hunters trying to find the Nazis hiding in South America. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Hmm. But... <sighs> If you're going to put yourself, Amy, into a simulation like that, I'm trying to figure out how he makes that turn eventually to realize this isn't real. Right. He, and again, I think because when he goes in and he, yeah, he runs away, captures the security guard, goes to the simulation and is like, take me home, be more specific, <laughs> uh, you know? And it's like, and then when? And he has that realization. I want to see us after we've won the war. What is it going to look like? So already he is acknowledging that this can create any reality. So now he needs to come to terms with his now reality. And I do think that that was really important in his transition, but he's still blocked from accepting it fully, in my opinion. Joe, I wanted to ask you something here uh, in the tropes that I found here. And I'm trying to remember because I've I list, I've listened to this one and a half times, to be honest with you. I didn't listen to it all the way through uh, on the first time. There was a continuity nod. And this is why we know that this episode would have been between eight and nine, eight um, midnight blue, nine domino, that several events and characters from prior episodes are referenced in the narration this includes the existence of Ed and Talia's daughter, so it is heavily advised to read this story in order of its release relative to the other episodes. I'm trying to remember, did Bruce Brock, Brock Seitner read that? Was there relation? Was there referencing that this had to take place between those two episodes? I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. What about you, um, Amy? Did you? Yeah, remember just that at all? the reference that he had a daughter and that that was a whole nother story 
and they right. sort of just washed it over like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of curious about that. So um, yeah, go ahead. So with in Star Trek, you have canon and non-canonical. Yes. And most of the time, up until I would say this recent Trek books, it's always been considered not canon. However, now with these Picard books and Strange New World, or sorry, uh, Discovery books that are coming out at the time of production, there's being put more weight into the books. Would you say that because Seth wrote it specifically as an episode, but then it got turned to a book that we can count this as canon? This is considered canon by Seth. He has stated that. Okay. Uh, it is canon. And that's why if there is a fourth season, he's tempted to actually make it into an episode. Uh, it can be re it could be the episode can be redone to where it can fit into whatever episode they want. But if you think about it too, this could be a standalone episode. You know, because there really isn't a lot of mention to what's happening outside of the ship, the Orville itself. You have the mention that the the Krill were the ones that captured uh, the parents that the the struggle with the Krill is still a thing. Mm -hmm. He's still got a daughter that's being held on Krill world. So that's still out there that you could totally take this episode and put it in front of a camera. Hey, where did they find Otto? Like what planet? Yeah, it was some planet where uh, they were doing some mining or something. I can't remember. Yeah, it was in the neutral zone, wasn't it? Mm. Near Romulan and, space. Yeah. yeah. And, and to save the child, they put him in the simulator and then they uh, got captured by the Krill and were taken away as prisoners themselves for like 20 years. So yeah, the yeah. simulation uh, just kept going and going and going. I don't remember the name of the planet. Did they have it cloaked? Like, why wouldn't the Krill find out about? I, th I think the Krill just wanted the the research, and the his par Otto's parents just gave themselves up, and they got captured. And down in the basement somewhere was the simulator running with Otto in it. And so why would the mother choose 1914 Germany? I mean, if we're talking 24th century, why this was go back? This was actually 1914 New York. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. It was in New York. And so she literally drops off her son. Uh, there might have, maybe they were doing some simulation during this time, right? Because this was 1914. So this is right. This is during World War One. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. right so I'm yeah. I'm guessing uh, they had something going on and they're historians, but, you know, and then for, you know, and there happened to be a German couple that was, right. you know, staying there at the hotel. And one thing just led to another, you know, I think it's I think it's a really easy one. It's in their off time, they're energy researchers during the day, they're busy at work. And then in their off time, they have their little Dixon Hill holodeck program that they go and how funny. Why, why didn't they drop him off in like a, a Brady Bunch like setting or something like that? You know? No, listen, I was thinking <laughs> about that and I'm like, okay, could there have been a time period where Adam wouldn't have turned into Otto? Because I was like, okay, well, maybe uh, now <laughs> drop him off, you know, say like, oh, everyone wants to, you know, when America was great again, like. 60s or 70s well then maybe Otto would have ended up with the kkk and still yeah. doing atrocious things atrocious things like is there a time period where his parents could have dropped him off on a simulation that okay. wouldn't one, have I ended got it. up I got it. I got one it. minor change not it's sorry kevin to interrupt you one minor change would make it all perfect so Drop him off in the simulation in New York, 1914. Yeah, instead of an old German couple that couldn't have kids, it's an old Scottish couple that couldn't have kids staying at the hotel, oh. and it takes them back to Scotland, and they all live happily ever after, eating haggis. Oh. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, 1982, Reseda, California, in the Valley. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> was Growing there not an earthquake? Malls, you know, an earthquake not long after that. <laughs> Scotland's like so safe and beautiful, so has to be yeah, Scotland. you know, take take him up the Isle of Skye, you know, and yeah. you know, make him a sheep farmer or something. Yeah, easy. <laughs> one I like that. Okay, guys, we got one more topic. Joe, you teased it earlier. 
Let's go I'm ahead sorry. and talk about some. Uh, let's talk about some holodeck. All right. I found an article. I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but it brought up a great discussion topic. And this is done by uh, Mark Donaldson for Screen Rant. It says the Orville's holodeck does what Star Trek never could. And he's talking about the mortality, the season three, episode three episode of uh, Orville Mortality Paradox. And um, I don't want to get into the whole article. He brought up a good, good thing about how he felt that the Orville was taken up taking bigger chances with the simulator slash the holodeck here. But I wanted to get your guys' thoughts. And Joe, I want you to start because you said that you want to kind of uh, bring up a, a particular point. But I did want to compare the holodeck episodes of Star Trek because there was a lot. A lot of shenanigans went on. There was uh, the holodeck would, you know, misfire and something would happen or Moriarty would take over. Or if you remember in Voyager... There was aliens that decided to use a Nazi themed hunting thing to take over uh, the Voyager. The killing uh, game. The killing yeah. game, yes. The what Herogen. Was the Herogen, thank you. Yeah. Uh, they were basically um, Voyage Voyager's version of the Klingons, I guess you could probably say that. Very warlike. Loved to hunt. The hunt. It was all about the hunt. And um, then we have several several great scenes in the Orville throughout the, the, the first three seasons regarding their, their version. Um, Joe, take it away. What, what do you, what do you want to say? Okay. I've come to the conclusion that Star Trek's holodecks are just dumb as dishwater, aren't they? They're not very, <laughs> they're not very smart. They just follow their programming and they do what they're told. Maybe with the exceptions of um, Vic Fontaine with his adaptive heuristic matrix or whatever they called it. Um, but we see the environmental simulator has taken it a step further and it's now got this ability where it can care for an infant um, throughout its entire life. Um, and that's kind of problematic because if it's that smart um, and that adaptive and got that ability, then why is it chosen to give this child to a German couple going back to Germany just before one of the worst times in the history of the planet? For humanity, that's I'm a good still point. That one, yeah. Now, Amy, we've had some very, uh, really good holodeck episodes through Star Trek and simulator episodes with the Orville. We've also had some cringe worthy ones, well, like you know, Bordis having his little uh fantasy mocklin thing going on, that was mm -hmm. a little cringe worthy there. Uh, and we've seen some other ones with Star Trek as well, but I wanted to get your thoughts on the differences. Do you think the simulator that Joe is referring to is a lot more superior, but also seems like a lot more dangerous at times as well? What do you think? Well, I find it interesting that they use the simulator slash holodeck for whatever the story needs. So is the holodeck just going to solve a problem of build a table and say like in schisms? Or is it going to be more adaptive, like Moriarty, you know, is programmed to overtake data? What What's that word I'm thinking of to, you know? Over, oh, uh, yes. Yeah. To beat data, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Evil data. Yeah. <laughs> data. So <laughs> whether the story needs it or not, is this holodeck or simulation, is that going to have AI technology or are we not going to use it that way? I think it just totally fits in with whatever the story needs, unfortunately, and there's not consistency. What I thought was interesting, guys, and I, I I do remember this in novella where I believe it was Otto where he threw up, he retched, and then um, the simulator was able to take it and recycle it and get rid of it. Am I remembering that right? Man, I don't remember that. I don't know. Joe, you're, you're on mute there. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? So I'm just saying it's been a beat since I listened um, last, so um, I honestly can't remember that one. Um, yeah, I thought there was something regarding that, uh, hmm. that, you know, whatever. Yeah. I think that uh, it just, it seemed like the simulator was a little more advanced and maybe that was done on purpose to allow it to, as you would say, Amy, um, fit the story, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, make it more 
gosh, you know, if you're going to get lost in a simulator, I, I got to imagine, um, does it get stinky after a while? I don't know what happens because, you know, dude's got to go to the bathroom, right? In the Lord weird... What's got, that? In Lord X, you've got your crew that come in, um, empty the... <laughs> That's right. From the That's right. I forgot about that. For the holiday. So... <laughs> Uh, maybe that's something that we're going to have to uh, um, explore, Amy, when we do our uh, Orville and uh, Star Trek Next Generation or Star Trek uh, comparisons to some of these uh, specific uh, holodeck and uh, simulator programs. Because, uh, um, you know, we, we we definitely had a good taste of both for sure. So uh, any other uh, comments regarding the holodeck versus the simulator, Joe? I, just to your point about the the Bortis and his happy time um, in the <laughs> environmental simulator, um, I don't know if that's cringeworthy. I think it just speaks to, do you know what you would do that kind of thing if you had an environmental simulator? Wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. If, I, 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 know, I, I, I would all would. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I might go out on a date with Kate Beckinsale. I'm just saying. <laughs> if we, I, I Amy, what about you? <laughs> okay. Well, I was just thinking like that Mocklin thing, like that would be their rise uh, or, you know, you've seen Jordy take Christy Henshaw on a date on the holodeck. So. Oh, oh Coco Nunos. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, before we get into a quick, I want to get Joe's thoughts and, and you too, Amy, uh, on the season three wrap up and just maybe, you know, throw out a, an episode that really stood out to you. But I did want to wrap up uh, Sympathy for the Devil here, um, the novella that came out in July of 2022. And uh, um, I do want to say that for me personally, uh, I thought it was a risk to do what it did. And I could see the challenges during COVID, the reasons officially that were uh, that Seth had given why they couldn't do it and why they had to cut this particular one. Um, but I can also see him, you know, revisiting this and, and doing it in a possible season four. But I can also see why maybe they're like, yeah, you know, maybe we don't do this right now during these times, maybe. Because if you think about it, um, while this was being made, and now what's happening here in the States anyway, um, a lot of tensions between, between um, political parties and race and stuff. I, I can only imagine that um, maybe there was another factor in why this also was chosen to not be done. I'm just mm -hmm. speculating here because, um, you know, there, there's some tough, tough, tough topics that they touched on this and a lot of hatred and, um, you know, a horrible time in our history, but I thought it was done really well regarding the novella. And it just made me really want to see how they would have handled this done in live action. Uh, your final thoughts on this novella, Amy. Yeah. As you were talking, I was just thinking like that whole thing with the Nazis and, and having Otto being raised in that is pretty fitting and relevant to us nowadays because we've got this older generation that has been raised to a degree with these blinders, with these ideologies. And can we transform those ideologies to something more current, something that's more inclusive, something... Uh, that is not destructive as much as the Nazis. And so to listen to that and see, yeah, did, did Otto change? Is he able to? Are we able to change the older generations who feel that this is the right way to go? It just seemed very relevant, just that last little bit. I would definitely recommend this novella. Um, I don't think listening to this first and then reading is going to destroy anything. I think it, it'll make more sense because as we mentioned, all of us were just sort of lost at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a very good novella and makes you think a lot. I listened to it twice. Yeah. 
I want to actually listen to it again, especially after the discussion and listening to yeah. Bruce in my ears. Good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Captain Sheridan back again. Yeah, Joe, uh, your final thoughts on uh, Sympathy for the Devil, Norville. Yeah, went in having no idea what to expect, but loving the Orville um, completely. Season three was, um, I don't remember, was it maybe my favourite sci-fi show of recent times? Um, yeah, loved everything about it like, in terms of season three, um, but the Sympathy for the Devil, um, just such a powerful and relevant storyline, especially nowadays... I don't live in America, but politics here is very divisive. You're either on one side or the other. Um, with what, any debate that comes up in politics, um, and I don't know if that's intentional to try and divide people, um, but I think we should always have that in mind and fight to come together to find some kind of common ground and the best in each other. Well said, well said. You know, uh, I was uh, just reminded, uh, Kyle and I did a uh, live episode of Culture Clash uh, last week where we did our Magic 8-Ball. And our, if you, for those of you that don't know that segment on Culture Clash, we uh, the Magic 8-Ball is uh, asking us our top eight of something. And we picked some type of fun fandom thing. And Kyle came up with the idea after the Magic 8-Ball had his way uh, of what are your most rewatchable TV series. And uh, Orville was number two for me. Number mm. one was Friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Star Trek TNG was number three. Uh, the Orville just shot up there because I've been rewatching these, especially since it's moved over to Disney Plus. I want to make sure that Disney knows that uh, people are really interested in the show. And I believe if I keep watching on Disney Plus, maybe they'll turn to Seth and say, who wants to do this and make another season? So maybe we'll get lucky enough. We'll see. Um, all right, guys. I want to talk about the rest of season three real quick because Joe I haven't had you on for an Orville uh, episode yet. So let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about the season. I'm just going to briefly mention it. Episode one of season three was electric sheep. And that's where the Orville nears completion uh, on a refit and space dock uh, resentment among the ships uh, compliment towards Isaac rises due to him being reinstated after betraying the planet uh, planetary union to the Kalon. Mm. Charlie of course is introduced in that uh, episode two is shadow realms. The Orville explores a mysterious region of space. I think that was the one with Claire's ex uh, that's now an officer. And then he gets, uh, he succumbs to uh, those, those creatures. If I remember right. correctly. Okay. The Mortality Paradox, the Orville crew discovers a sign of a modern civilization on a planet uh, known to be in, uh, um, uninhabited. And that's the one that refers back to that alien or the humanoid planet that disappears. Um, that Yeah, but that was the one that uh, Kelly was the one where she was a church, basically. Oh, and, the Kelly, yeah. Yeah, and then they develop into this super human Q-like species. Yes. And that was with Denal, played by Elizabeth Giles, uh, basically. So, yeah. Um, and then episode four was Gently Falling Rain. The Orville crew land, leads a union delegation to sign a peace treaty with the Krill. And I think that's where he finds out about his daughter, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, Tale of Two Topas, episode five. Tensions between Kelly and the Mockman's result in when she helps Topa prepare for the Union Point entrance exam. Mm, that's uh, where they have the beef between Kelly and... Uh, Clyden, right? Clyden, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, twice in a lifetime, the crew must rescue Gordon from a distant yet familiar world. This is where he goes back in time. He gets stuck back there. He ends up living with the girl that uh, he, they had their, she, they had her phone from the time capsule. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And uh, for unknown graves, the Orville discovers a Kalon with a very special ability. That's the one that uh, was deprogrammed, basically. And uh, that's the one where things between um, uh, the doctor and, of course, uh, uh, Isaac. Uh, Isaac get a little more uh, romantic, I guess. And then Midnight Blue, as we mentioned, crew visits uh, Havina's sanctuary world and embark on a journey that leave the Union more vulnerable. And Domino, of course, the creation of the powerful weapon that puts the crew and the entire Union in a political and ethical drama. And Future Unknown, we get the wedding of Claire and Isaac and a nice little reunion, too, of Alara that comes to visit as well. So 
Joe, I want to get your thoughts. First of all, was this the best season of the Orville? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I was, I haven't seen season three in a while. Um, but as you were giving us the synopsis of each episode, I was like, I really have to go back and watch it. Okay, the standout episodes for me, um, really, I think the most powerful episode in all of sci-fi. Um, if it isn't um, the the novella, um, then it's the the time travel one. Um, twice, twice in a lifetime. In a lifetime. Oh, Isn't yes. that just he's he's got a wife and he's got kids, and yeah. they just don't exist at the end. Amy, How I cried you? too. I cried too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, didn't, was... I didn't cry. I didn't cry, but I did cry. Uh, um, well, I uh, did cry, Joe. Well, and no, I'm that's fine. fine. That's fine. <laughs> I did cry recently um, with episode three of The Last of Us, just so I can be in the same group. <laughs> yes oh man that was a good one too no i remember twice in a lifetime and saying when we covered it they did time travel so i absolutely understand this <laughs> grandfather this looping back living a life different timeline oh but ripping him away from his family was brutal all. Yeah, it, it was. was so powerful, uh. so impactful, and they just did it right. That is an amazing, loopy timeline perfection. But the thing is, it's worse for us as the viewer. It's okay for Gordon because he has no what happened to him in the episode didn't happen. Right. We are yeah. the only ones with the memory of what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the trauma is purely for the viewer. Mm -hmm. the that was the one with that, that was the one where. They make the sandwich disappear, right? Yes, and come back. <laughs> yes. yes, and then it comes back in the last episode. Oh, that was kind of funny. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> um, um, that is also twice in a lifetime is also my favorite one too. But I want to give a, a shout out to Tale of Two Topas because that's the one where Topa decides to go back to being female, and that is where uh, you know all the tension really starts. And I remember that Bordis has the concert to distract everyone else so mm -hmm. that the um, procedure can happen. Right. And Clyden finds out about it and tensions get really, really high. And, oh, that was such a good one there. But um, I really yeah, I can't decide on that, that because that whole arc, I mean, starting from, you know, season one and two. Yeah. And, yeah, so I, I don't... I love Tell of Two Topas, but I love Midnight Blue, too. I, I, I don't know that I could pick. I mean, and I loved when, oh, uh, kid name Topa. Yeah, when he, she was born. Yeah. And yep. that whole argument, like it has gone through seamlessly and has been a very season beautiful. Season one, episode three. Yep. Uh, that, that's, that was About the time for the Orville. A yeah. boy about a girl or something like yeah, that. Yeah, about a about a girl. Yeah. About a girl. Yeah. 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 I previous oh. previously to season three, I thought the the episode with the giant battle scene where the Kalon attack the the Union um and like there's ships crashing into the moon and it's just like everybody's yeah. gonna be wiped out. That was I think that's one of my favorite episodes of anything really ever. It's just visually, it's just such eye candy. Um, but then uh, another rule standout for me is Domino. Oh, um, yeah. Ted Danson dies. Yeah, we, we get our first bad roll <laughs> <Yes. laughs> in right? the you know, and they find out that he's going to go back and give himself up and uh, let him know what's happening. And they, they destroy his ship. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one to pill there. But if I had one complaint about the Orville, it's petty. Is there's not enough merchandise? I need Orville <laughs> action figures and toys, and all I've got is a is a ship and some DVDs from season one and two and a T-shirt. You know, I need some more Orville merch. I ah man, Do I really know? thought once they Kevin went over Lee. to Disney that they would be you know well yeah. funded. Yeah, it didn't happen. Yeah, definitely, Joe, definitely. Kevin, it looks like you maybe have to buy a bigger house. I know, right? 
What are you talking about, Joe? Oh, that is we've... your guest room, an entire <laughs> wall, floor to ceiling, uh, books and DVDs and everything. I know. I get, I get the struggle. I also need a larger house. <laughs> so um, Joe sympathizes with my plight. Gotcha. <laughs> yes. Like we have like all the Eagle Moss Star Trek starships. Um, I, I just no space for them. I just want to mention too, when I was, as you did, Amy, you watched uh, Midnight Blue and Domino uh, just to kind of get the feeling of where uh, Sympathy for the Devil would fit. And my favorite line, I believe, is in, I think in the last episode, um, uh, oh shoot, what was it called? Um, Future Unknown, where the ladies are talking about the marriage and, and you know, they Ed comes in, he gets kind of stuck and then he makes a, you know, they ask him, like, what do you think Claire should do? And he says, well, Claire, you should ask your kids. What do they think? And they all look at each other. And then Kelly goes, you've been useful, sober man. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I love the writing. I love this crew. I, I hope we get to see them together, maybe in at least a movie. What about you, Amy? Yes, we need a season four. And I am actually hopeful more so than I am with getting another Star Trek movie, <clears throat> that we're going to get a season four. Seth is definitely promoting, and I've heard him say, let people know that you want the Orville, so we need to get out there. Well, even if you have to just stream a, a season on Disney Plus and then walk away and go to work, make that happen. Joe, I know you want to see a movie or, or season four. I want to see... Uh, yeah, I want to see a, a new season or maybe another couple of seasons of the Orville with 26 episodes per season. Oh, um, back like back in the good old days, more than I want to see, uh, I'm going to say it, more than I want to see season three of Picard. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't blame you, Joe. I, I'm like there too. I, I really hope that season three of Picard delivers, especially what we've been, they've been teasing us. And we'll be covering that here on the Union Federation. And uh, Joe, maybe you can come on for an episode and talk about Picard because uh, we would love to have some uh, new voices. Because uh, uh, I've not been the there. biggest fan of Picard. No. The first two seasons. No. Mm -hmm. Um. Ugh, lots of things didn't work for me. Watched it multiple times. Yeah. Um, now here you're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll uh, get a good season three. Uh, we're definitely going to be covering it here. But uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Let's get in some contact information. All right. First of all, Joe, thank you so much for coming on and talking Orville sympathy for the devil, man. Thank you for having me. That was a lot of communicator beeps. <laughs> <laughs> that was like your communicator that I don't know was trying to update its OS and get stuck in a loop. Yeah, um, it was st stuck in a loop and in the simulator and in a transporter. So yeah, <laughs> all simultaneously. Oh, that never ever happens. Yeah, we need some fail safes for that. Uh, but no, Kevin, thanks for having me on. It's been great fun talking about something that's really. Um, was a great read um, and I think really important. So, yeah. Well, first of all, everyone, thank you for listening and thank you for watching on YouTube. Uh, you can find, of course, the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube and also you can find our master audio feed at fpnet.podbean.com and you can join our Federation uh, Union Federation Podcast Facebook group. We talk both, of course, Star Trek and the Orville there. would love to get you in there. And the Union Federation is also on Twitter and Instagram. You can also email us at the Union Federation at gmail.com. My name is Kevin. I am on Twitter um, at Spartan underscore Phoenix and also on Instagram at Spartan underscore Phoenix. You can find Kyle at a Kyle W. You can find Haley uh, at Trekkie01D. Amy, where can we find you in this BQN? Well, I do have a couple shows over there on BQN, uh, All Good Things, which talks about all of Star Trek, and Galaxy Class, which what? is what? Uh, Next Generation, and little surprise, Joe and I were going to announce here first, because we haven't even told <laughs> people over there, we are going to be following the wise council of uh, Union Federation and doing some episodes on YouTube. So we're, 
Yay. We're looking forward to it. And so you can catch us on YouTube covering each episode of Picard season three, since we are claiming it really is next generation. Right, so. it's, it's yeah. Season, I don't know, 27 <laughs> or something. Yes. Definitely. That's really, really cool. I'm excited for you guys. Yeah. So you can find me there on BQN uh, on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson. And of course, in our Facebook groups. Really, Amy, just, just Amy, just tell people where people can't find you. That would be a <laughs> list, possibly. Joe, where can we find you? Uh, you can get me on uh, Instagram or the Insta, as the kids like to say, at joeyjoe77uk. And you can also use that handle on Twitter, but I don't really like to use Twitter um, because Elon Musk's a bit nuts. Um, and you could email me if you wish, joepodcasts at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, first of all, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Amy, it's always good to see you and uh, looking forward to uh, having you uh, drop in on Picard as well. And yes. uh, if you need some other people to drop on on your stuff too, uh, throwing my hand up in the air. I'd love, love to join you guys. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much. Joe, thanks again. And until next time, guys, we'll see you on the Union Federation and uh, check us out on the socials as well. All right. Please, please bring back the Orville. Fingers crossed. Let's make it happen. <laughs> All right. Coming up next for Union Fed, Star Trek Picard, Season 3. See you guys there. See you guys. Bye. Bye.